Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Today I want to talk about a very very important topic in geometry and that's called the theory of vector bundles. And in this little video here I just want to give a brief informal first look at this rather interesting subject. Okay, so to start off I guess I should define what I mean by a vector bundle. And I won't give a full definition or a proper definition here but I'll give you an informal definition which gives you a good feel for what that object is. Okay, so the starting point is going to be a topological space. Uh, there's actually lots of different contexts in which you can talk about vector bundles. And we'll just stop, we'll just look at the case where we're looking in the topological setting, in the category of topological spaces. Uh, so you can also do this in other geometric categories, but for today we'll just look at this special setting here. Okay, so what's a real vector bundle of rank R on this topological space X? Well, the way to think of it is it's a family of vector spaces VP, one for each point P of X, and these vector spaces should be real, hence a real vector bundle, and the rank corresponds to the fact that all of these vector spaces should have the same dimension equal to R, the rank of that vector bundle. So that's basically the way to think of it and the last condition that you want is that you want these vector spaces VP, this family of vector spaces, to vary continuously as you move this P along X. Okay, so what's the first example that one should think of when one tries to learn about vector bundles? Well the first one and the easiest one to understand what happens in this theory is when x is actually a manifold. Okay? If this is a smooth manifold, you can talk about its tangent bundle. So v, you're going to let equal to the tangent bundle, and this is a family of vector spaces. Okay? So suppose this manifold has dimension d, or maybe dimension r, if you want to use this uh, notation here. Then at each point p of this manifold, you can talk about the tangent space to x at p. And if this manifold is dimension r, that will be an r-dimensional vector space. So there you get vp. And as you vary this point, this vector space will vary continuously. So if you're not too familiar with manifolds, you can just look at a very simple example here. So here I've drawn x is just some curve, perhaps a circle inside the plane. And let's suppose we pick any point there. So here's a point P. So with that point P, we can talk about the tangent line at that point. And that essentially will be the tangent space to X at P. Okay, so how is it a vector space? So firstly, at the moment it's just a line but it has a distinguished point P. So if you translate, or in other words, change coordinates so that this P is the origin, this becomes a one-dimensional subspace of the R2 that it sits inside. Okay? So in other words, you get a one-dimensional subspace, which is a tangent space, and it's a vector space. Now as you move this P, you can see if you move it around, what happens? This tangent line moves continuously. So there's your family of one-dimensional, in this case, vector spaces, which varies continuously as you move the point along this manifold X. Okay? So that's how you should think of a real vector bundle. And in this case here, uh, this is one-dimensional, so this is a vector bundle of rank 1. Okay, so the question I want to answer in the video today is the following. Why are mathematicians interested in vector bundles? And there are lots and lots of good reasons why. And that's what I want to tell you about. Okay, so the first answer to this question is they give lots of interesting examples. Okay, so let's look at the first one. And the first one is called the trivial bundle, so it is somewhat trivial, but nevertheless, it's going to be very important. Okay, so the first one is we have our topological space X here. 
And what we do is we just form the product of that topological space with R to the R. So just the R dimensional vector space of R tuples. Okay, so we want to think of this as a vector bundle of rank R. So how's that? So for each point P inside X, we need an R dimensional vector space. And the one that we'll pick there is just uh, P cross RR. It's going to be this subset of X cross R that's floating above this P. And that's, of course, just uh, an R-dimensional vector space, VP. Okay, so you can think of lots of examples of that. Okay, so for example, if you have uh, our X is just this interval here, the black line giving this interval here, so you can think of that as being homeomorphic to the unit interval. Then if little r is equal to 1, you just cross it with r. So you can think of that as being homeomorphic to the red lines here. And so here's an example of the unit interval cross this r, the real numbers, to the 1. Also, instead of looking at this unit interval for my x, I can change that to a circle just by identifying the endpoints. Okay, so if you do that here by identifying endpoints, we'll see we get another example of a vector bundle on a different manifold. So here, here's my circle, it's a black line where I identified the endpoints of that uh, black line there. And again, I've just crossed it with a copy of the real line, and that's seen by these red lines here. Okay, so that's a trivial example, but it's actually very, very important. But I hope you can see from my little prop here how you can get more interesting examples. So you've probably seen the Mobius band. So if you haven't, let me just show you what happens. So now what we're going to do is we're going to unclip this. And instead of putting the two ends together like this, we're going to flip them around. So there's a half twist involved. So let's put that half twist in and see what we get. This is called the Mobius band, which is a very, very interesting object in mathematics. OK, so here we get the Mobius band. OK, so as you can see now, if you look at the black line, it runs around here, goes around, and then kind of goes inside. Okay, but nevertheless, you still get a circle. So you get a circle there, and through each point of the circle, this black line, through each point of that, you still get a line through it. So you still get a family of these red lines, so a family of R's, one for each point on this black line, which forms a circle. So here you get another rank 1 vector bundle on the circle, which is this black line. But of course, as you can see from what's here, it's very, very different from the trivial bundle. Okay, It's very, very different from the trivial bundle, which looks just like this. This is the trivial bundle on the circle S1. Right? So they're two very interesting mathematical objects. And how can we check that they're different? Okay, and in what sense are they different? Well, the point is that the theory of vector bundles is about studying such objects. Okay, so there are two interesting examples already of vector bundles, which should suggest why we should study these things and why mathematicians are interested in the study of vector bundles. Another interesting source of examples comes from algebraic geometry. So if you remember, in algebraic geometry, there's this interesting duality between commutative algebra on one hand and varieties, or more generally, uh, geometric objects called schemes on the other. And if vector bundles are interesting things in geometry, then presumably there should be some interesting algebraic analog of it when you use this geometry algebra duality. And what is that? Well, it turns out that the things corresponding to these vector bundles on the algebra side are finitely generated projective modules. So if you've studied 
a lot of algebra, then you would know that projective modules are very, very interesting modules. Okay, so maybe the first place that you see projective modules is when you look in algebraic number theory and you look at the theory of fractional ideals. So these fractional ideals are examples of projective modules and these projective modules actually correspond to rank one vector bundles on the algebraic variety at hand. So they're very, very interesting modules. So as we can see, the theory of vector bundles gives us lots of interesting mathematical objects to study. So why else are mathematicians interested in vector bundles? Well, the second answer to this question is the following. Given a vector bundle V, we can talk about their sections. And these sections generalize the notion of vector-valued functions on X. Okay, so let's give an informal look at what a section of a vector bundle V is. So what is that? All it is, is it's a type of function on x, so if you input an element p of x, it outputs a vector vp, but this vector vp sits inside the vector space big vp, where this big vp is the vector space that corresponds to the point p in this vector bundle. Okay, So it sends a point of x to a vector space, but the thing that's a little bit different from a normal function, and rather curious, is that this vector space moves with this p. So there's, so to speak, a moving codomain. As you change the value of p, where the output sits is in a different place. It's in a different vector space. Okay, so what's one reason why you might be interested in looking at such a thing? Well, again, if you look at the case of the tangent bundle, it's a very, very natural mathematical object to study. Okay, so let's suppose we have some manifold x, perhaps like this x here, I have a circle here, and remember we have a tangent bundle, and that's the family of vector spaces given by these tangent spaces at each point. So a section is what? So for each point of x, for example this p here, you pick a vector inside the corresponding vector space. So you have to pick a vector inside here. So it's some sort of tangent vector to this uh, circle in this case. So it's something like this. Now what happens as you move this point to a different one? If you move it to a different one, this function will have a value, but it's now inside A different vector space in this case the tangent space to x at q so that's that tangent line here like that so you get another tangent vector maybe something like this so at each point basically in this case here for this vector bundle all you do is for each point you give a tangent vector and of course what's that that's just the notion of a vector field okay so that's a very important thing that arises in lots of places in mathematics. And the key thing to note here is that this is a function on x, but the outputs lie in different places as you move the input around. So here you have the output inside this tangent space, but as you move to another input like q, the output is in a different tangent space. Okay, so that's another very important reason why we look at vector bundles. And this is extremely important in algebraic geometry, in fact, because in algebraic geometry, there are very, very few globally defined functions, and so we need a more general notion of functions to map into projective space. And the theory of line bundles in particular, so rank one vector bundles, are the secret to getting many more functions. Of course, what do you do with functions? One of the things that it allows you to do is it allows you to map from one space to another. So the projective space is a very, very important example in algebraic geometry. But the other thing it allows you to do is that if you can talk about functions, you can talk about the zeros of the functions. And when you can talk about the zeros of the functions, they give you subsets of the, um, in this case, this x, the, the domain. And they can be quite interesting mathematical objects in their own right. Okay, so now let's look at another reason why vector bundles are interesting to look at for mathematicians. 
Suppose now you're not looking just at one topological space, x, but you're looking at two, x and y, and one invents in the other. And let's look at the example where the, both of these are manifolds. So this is an embedding of manifolds. Okay, so the, perhaps the picture that you want to think of here is y is some surface, maybe the plane like what you see here. Okay, just think of this as a plane. And x is a curve like a circle inside here. And here you have a point. Now I'm going to introduce a new uh, vector bundle. Okay, it's called the normal bundle, and I'll denote it n on this x. Okay, and it depends both on the x and the y. So what do I need to do? I need to give for every point p here a vector space. Okay, and what is that vector space? Well, the vector space is as follows. So the vector space n p is going to be defined as follows. We first look at the tangent space at p of y. So in this case here, if y is a plane, it's just going to be two-dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, just R2. And then what we do now is we quotient that vector space with the tangent space to x at p. So that's the quotient by this line here. Okay, so let's have a little think about that. You've got the quotient of vector spaces. So in this case, of course, it's easy to identify a quotient of vector spaces with the orthogonal complement of the smaller sp space. Okay, so this quotient, you have this R2, okay, and then you're going to quotient out by this one-dimensional subspace, which is this tangent line here. And then what you get is the orthogonal complement. So in this case, since this is two-dimensional, y, and x is one-dimensional, it's just a normal line. And I'll draw it fairly small like that, okay? So just a small line. Because up to homeomorphism, a one-dimensional vector space is homeomorphic to just a, an open interval like that. Okay, so for each point P, that's going to be our one-dimensional vector space. It's just going to be a normal line, essentially, okay? And so forth. Okay? And my claim as that this normal bundle tells us a lot about how x is embedded in y. Okay, so let's see why that's the case. Okay, so how are you thinking of this normal bundle? Remember, it's just a family of vector spaces. Okay, it's a family of normal spaces. So in this case here, the normal space is just one dimensional, it's a normal line. So it varies like this. Okay, it just varies like this as you go around. Okay, so what happens? So these are all normal lines, but they're actually one-dimensional vector spaces. So they also have a zero, and where is the zero? The zero is the point of tangency or normalcy. Okay. So if you think about what that is, it looks just like a copy of x. So there's a copy of x in there inside this normal bundle where all the values are zero. Okay. So that's the zero section. So you can think of the zero section as a map from x to, to this n and that allows you to view x as a sub-object of n, in fact a sub-manifold. Okay? And of course since you're just using the tangent bundle to create this n, it only really depends on infinitesimal information about each point of x. Okay? So if you're far away from x, Okay, this normal bundle can't tell you anything about what's happening there. But the infinitesimal information about how x sits inside y is actually completely recorded in this embedding of x into this normal bundle. Okay, so the way to think of this normal bundle, as it turns out, is it's a first order approximation of the embedding of this manifold x inside y. So in general, it's quite complicated how one manifold can embed inside another. So what you do is you use calculus to give a simpler version of it, and this is the simpler version that you can use to study that embedding. And now I want to give you the fourth reason why mathematicians are interested in vector bundles. And that's because the collection of isomorphism classes of vector bundles actually gives us an invariant with which to study a topological space X. And to understand how this works, I'll give a simple example uh, that's based on the following fact. Okay, so suppose you're given a topological space X, which is compact and Hausdorff, 
and also most importantly contractible, so it's homotopically trivial. Then in this case, every vector bundle on X turns out to be trivial. So by a trivial bundle, I just mean one which is isomorphic to X cross a finite dimensional vector space. Okay, so this is a very interesting fact that for essentially contractible topological spaces, vector bundle theory is trivial because every vector bundle is isomorphic to a trivial one. So how can you use this to study a topological space X? Okay, so how should you think about this fact? Well, let's look at the co contrapositive of this statement. Suppose instead you have a vector bundle which is not trivial. If the topological sp space is compact and Hausdorff, that tells you then that that topological space isn't contractible. And if you push this further, if you look at the collection of isomorphism classes of vector bundles, the more different ones you have, the further you are away from being contractible. That means the more complicated that topological space is homotopically. So our upshot here is the collection of isomorphism classes of vector bundles on a topological space X that in some ways measures the obstruction to contractibility. So this collection of isomorphism classes of vector bundles leads to an invariant called K-theory, which is a very, very important subject in geometry. Okay, so let's see an example of how this works in practice. And we'll go to our favorite example here, which is the circle. It's a simple one. So our topological space X is S1. And the way we'll think of this circle, of course, the easiest way is to think of the unit interval 0, 1, where we've just identified the 0 and the 1. Okay, and we've seen two types of vector bundles on here. The first one is the trivial one, so we can look at S1 cross R. And we've also seen the Mobius band, which is quite interesting as well. And what I want to show in this example is that the Mobius band is actually not trivial. And once we know it's not trivial, by this fact here, that will tell us that S1 is not a contractible topological space since it's compact and Hausdorff. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we show that the Mobius band is not contractible? Okay, the technology we, that we're going to use is the technology of sections, which I talked about, okay, and more precisely, continuous sections. Okay, so let's have a look at the trivial bundle, which is S1 cross R. So remember, we want to think of S1 as the unit interval 0 to 1, where we've identified 0 and 1. Okay, so what about S1 cross R? Now, for each of the points on the circle, so these two are identified now, we have a copy of R. So there's our family of vector spaces, a copy of R for each point on the circle. Okay, so there's our family of one-dimensional vector spaces like that. Of course, 0 is the same as 1 in the circle, so we have to identify this copy of the real number line here with this one here. So another way to think of the trivial bundle on S1, S1 cross R, is we look at 0, 1 cross R, that's essentially the blue picture here, but we identify this vector space here, this one-dimensional vector space above 0, with this one-dimensional vector space over here. Okay, so the point X on here so maybe this one here, that's X, say, gets identified with the corresponding point on this one-dimensional vector space. Okay, so that's one way to think of this trivial bundle. And now we can consider the notion of sections of this trivial bundle. Okay, so what's that? So remember that's a function from S1 to this bundle. And what you have to do is for each point here on S1, you have to pick a point in the corresponding vector space. So that's the corresponding line above it. Okay, so maybe you pick, for example, this point here in this line. Okay? And you have to do that for each point. And we'll pick a continuous section, so this point should move around continuously as you slide this point across from 0 to 1. Okay? So let's uh, pick one example. So suppose, for example, uh, the value at 0 is going to be 1 here. 
Now, since it's 0 and 1 are the same, that means that if we pick this point, we also have to pick this point. And for this function, essentially we draw a graph. And since we want a continuous section, uh, we want a continuous graph. So we could just, for example, pick just a constant value 1 here. That's an example of a continuous section of this trivial bundle here. Okay. Now what's interesting about this section here is that the value is a constant 1 and more importantly it's never 0. It never attains the value 0 here. Okay. So that's the trivial bundle, an example of a section here and one which is never 0. Let's now look at the Mobius band. So this is very similar to what we had over here in the trivial bundle. Remember we can look at it as this 0, 1 interval, and we cross it with R, so that's like this strip here, and then we identify the ends. And we remember with the Mobius band, it's the same except for when we identify the ends, we just put in a half twist, okay, like that. So that's the only difference between the trivial bundle here and the Mobius band. So let's see how it plays out in what I've written down here, okay? So again, we start with the same sort of a picture. We have 0 to 1, this unit interval, 0 to 1, and we cross it with R. But the difference is that when we identify this line, this one-dimensional vector space with this one-dimensional vector space, we need to put in a half twist. So rather than identifying corresponding points like this, we need to identify this line, we need to twist it over and identify it like that. Okay, so for example, this point here is the same as the point which is the negative on this side. But otherwise, it's the same sort of situation as we have above here. Okay, let's write that down in this quotient space notation here. We start off with the same space, the unit interval 0, 1 cross R. But now 0, comma, x is not identified with 1, comma, x. It's instead identified with 1, comma, minus x. Okay. So what I want to do now is to show you that this line bundle, so it's a rank 1 vector bundle, is actually not isomorphic to this trivial bundle. And the way I'll do that is to look at continuous sections here. Okay, So what I want to show you that is that unlike this trivial bundle case, there are no nowhere zero continuous sections. Okay, So let's try to make one. See why that's true and try to make one. Okay, So what do you have to do to get you a section? So essentially it's like a graph, remember, for each point of S1. So we'll do it at each point from 0 to 1 where we'll identify 0 and 1. Okay, for each of these points, we need to pick a point in the corresponding one-dimensional vector space. So maybe something like this. Okay, so above zero, you have to pick some value on here. Maybe it's this one here. And remember, this point is the same as this point here. So if you pick this point for zero, you have to pick this point for one. Okay, and now again, we just have to draw a continuous graph. Okay, so we draw a continuous graph. And we try to make one which is never zero. But unfortunately, we have to end up at this point here. And if we're to end up at this point here, we can see from the intermediate value theorem that somewhere this continuous section must be zero. Okay? So by looking at the continuous sections, rather curiously, we can show that these two vector bundles are actually very different. So this is a fact which, of course, when you look at the Mobius band, you can see it's very different from this one here. But this gives you a way to actually prove that this Mobius band is not isomorphic to this one here. OK, so what's the upshot of all this? The upshot of all this is the fact that you can build this non-trivial vector bundle on S1 tells you that S1 is not contractible. And that's how the theory of vector bundles can be used to study a topological space. So in this case here, it tells you something immediately about S1. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.